Welcome to the closing keynote. Um, I think you're in for a real treat. I know you are. Um, I've known our closing keynote speaker for 20 years. And when I first met her, she told me about all these wonderful things that they were doing in Houston with families and family preservation and innovation at uh, DePelchin Children's Home. And I hear this quite often as I travel around the country. And I go, uh huh. And so I sort of took it with a grain of salt. So I said, do you mind if I come down and visit you sometime and see what you all are doing? And she said, oh, yeah, come on down to Houston. And uh, I did. And I found out she's a very modest woman. They were doing fabulous work. And the family-based services that is now widespread throughout Texas and in many respects leading the country was begun by Twyla Ross and her group at DePelchin. Uh, since that time, she's gone on to do incredible, innovative work throughout Houston and doing training all over the country. Uh, she's getting ready to train people and work with states um, on family preservation through the uh, National Resource Center in Iowa. And I kind of lost track of her for a couple years, and she was off working with women and building a great center uh, for reintegrating women back into society that had been in, in prison. And I was talking to Joe Levine, uh, who's a the administrator of the Harris County CPS, I said, I need to find Twyla Ross because we are going to do another conference. He said, oh, she's right below us. And for a minute I thought, oh my God, she passed away. <laughs> and then I knew she could never pass away. You'll see from her energy. He said, no, literally, she's in the office right below us. I said, bye, and I ran down and she came out and it was a wonderful reunion. And since I've been back in, in working in Houston, it's been great to work with her. Uh, Twyla is one of the most innovative, inspirational people in the child welfare and family service field in the United States and perhaps the world. And as the planning committee was putting this program together, we were talking about all the cutbacks and the technicalities with regulations and everything. We said we need to end the this round table on an inspirational, upbeat uh, ty uh, moment. And everyone said, we need to get Twyla Ross. And so without further ado, here is the Twyla Ross. So Twyla. <laughs> That's very sweet. That's very sweet. That's <clears throat> It puts me at a disadvantage because it makes me feel a little emotional. But I don't, I don't know which is more important to me, Alvin's introduction or, or uh, the young woman who uh, came up to me in the pool yesterday and wrapped her arms around me and gave me a big kiss and said, you are the cutest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> well, we get to be my age, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. If they notice you at all, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different today uh, than what you've been uh, uh, doing. Uh, at this conference. Um, I, I first want to begin by telling you I had never been to this conference before and I have met some of the most remarkable people at this conference and I, I wrote my my words uh, before I came and uh, I did it because it, it, it's on my heart. It's what's on my heart and um, when you when you raise your hand to do this then that's one of the advantages is you get to say what's on your heart and hope that that it really resonates with the people. And, and everybody that's talked with me have told me things that just go back to what I've written and, and have really been amazing stories about courage and about faith and about commitment um, to this field of social work and to the people that do it. Um, the reason this is a little bit different today, one of the things that I want to ask you to do is I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. And then I'm going to ask you while I'm talking about these stories, I'm going to be asking you to think about your stories, to think about the things that might have happened in your life that, that are similar to what I'm going to be talking about. Um, because what I want to do is I want, I want to ask you to, to tell snippets of your story in just a moment. Uh, and, and because I think that when it's all said and done, uh, and, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later too, is, is that it's, it's our stories, the stories that are our own stories, and the stories that we hear that really, um, I know they give me the passion I have for this work. They give me the energy that I have for this work. 
And it isn't it remarkable to think about being in this job for 43 years, how many stories you've heard, and that you can say with all confidence that I have never heard any two stories that are the same. What a blessing that is to be able to have that kind of hearing and to know that and to know that many people. Um, so I'm going to begin with a story about Teddy, and it's a true story. The stories I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you two at the beginning. But the story I'm going to tell you about Teddy and the one later is a true story. It's a story about really an elementary school teacher. And maybe you've heard this. Some of you are in teaching, and so maybe you've heard this story. If you have, be patient with me till we get to the next one. Um, it's about a, a, an elementary school teacher named Miss Thompson, and she was teaching fifth grade. And on the first day of class, she stood up in front of her class, as most teachers do, and she looked at her students, and she told them a lie. She told them that she was going to love them all the same. But you see, that was impossible, because on the front row, there was a little boy named Teddy. And Miss Thompson had watched Teddy the year before, and she noticed that he didn't play well with the other children. And she noticed that his clothes were messy, and she noticed that he constantly needed a bath. He was unpleasant. And so at that point, Miss Thompson found that she would delight, actually delight, in taking her bold red pen and marking X's on his paper and giving him F's. But the school that she taught in required that she review his previous record, academic record. And she put his off to the very last. And finally she goes in and pulls the file, and she sees a note from the first grade teacher who says, Teddy is a bright child. He has a ready laugh. He has excellent manners. He's a joy to be around. She goes, whoa. Second grade teacher wrote, Teddy's an excellent student, and he is liked by all his classmates. Whoa. But he's a little troubled because his mom has a terminal illness, and life at home must be a struggle for him. The third grade teacher wrote, Teddy's mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do the best he can, but his father doesn't seem to show much interest, and his home life will soon affect him if something isn't done. The fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy's withdrawn. He doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have any friends, and sometimes he sleeps in class. Now Miss Thompson realized the problem, and she was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when the students all brought her presents for Christmas. And in the middle of the presents were Teddy's present. All the others were wrapped in bright paper with ribbons, and Teddy's was wrapped in a grocery bag. And when she opened it, the children were laughing, and she, she calmed them, and she opened it, and inside she found a rhinestone bracelet with several stones missing, and a bottle of perfume that had a quarter of the perfume still left in it. And she went on and on about the bracelet. She said it was beautiful, and she put it on immediately, and she put a little perfume on her wrist. And Teddy stayed after school, and he said to her, Miss Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to smell. And after the school, after the children had left, she cried. And that day, Miss Thompson quit teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic, and Miss Thompson started teaching children. Miss Thompson paid attention to Teddy. She worked with him. She watched his mind come alive, and then she encouraged him. He responded, and at the end of the year, he became one of her best students. A year later, she found a note under her door from Teddy saying, you are the best teacher I've ever had in my life. Six years later, she found another note from him. He said he'd finished high school. He graduated third in his class, and she was still the best teacher he'd ever had in his life. Four years after that, she got another letter, and he graduated from college. He had highest honors, and again, he said, you need to know, Miss Thompson, you are my favorite teacher and the best teacher I've ever had in my life. Six more years passed, and this time he explained that he had gone a little further in school, and he wanted her to know that she was still the best and his most favorite teacher. But his name was a little longer now, and he signed the letter. Theodore Stoddard, M.D. But the story doesn't end there. You see, another letter came in the spring, and Teddy told her he had found a girl and he was going to marry her. 
and his dad had passed away two years earlier, and he wanted to know if Miss, if Miss Thompson would come and sit in the place reserved for the groom's mother for his wedding, and of course she said she would. She wore the bracelet, she put on the perfume, and they hugged each other. And Dr. Stoddard said in Miss Thompson's ear, thank you, Miss Thompson, for believing in me. Thank you for making me feel important. Thank you for showing me that I could make a difference. And Miss Thompson, with tears in her eyes, said, Teddy, you have it all wrong. Thank you for teaching me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. Now the lesson is true. The lesson is true for all of us that are committed to teaching, that we always learn more than we ever teach. Miss Thompson was courageous and she was willing to change her perspective and she was willing to change her truth. She was willing to step out of her comfort zone. She questioned her teaching and she responded to the situation immediately. Now the next story is my story. I came from a small town in Alabama and nobody in my family graduated high school. So when I was 15 years old, I hoped to graduate high school. When a minister's wife said to me, where are you going to college? <laughs> I said, I'm not going to college. Oh, yes, you are, she said. You're much too smart to not go to college. And so she helped me fill out the paperwork. She helped me go to college. And after I got my bachelor's degree, I wrote her a letter and I thanked her. And then I married. Then I had a baby and I wrote her and thanked her. Then when I got my master's degree, I wrote her and I thanked her. And then two years ago, I was invited to write a chapter in a book on philanthropy. It was a, it's a delightful book. And it was on the things that have touched our lives and what's made a difference and what are the turning points. That's, that's what I want you to think about today. Where were the turning points? So I wrote a chapter and I wrote about her. And she's in New York, she's 83. I sent her a copy of the book, wrote her a beautiful card, and she called me. And she said that book and that card arrived on the day that she was having a run-in with her 15-year-old foster daughter. And what they'd been arguing about was she overheard her foster daughter and a couple of her friends just railing against this other girl, just talking trash about her. And Fern sat her down and said, honey, you've got to understand how important words are. Words hurt. And words can lift up. And she said the girl was just glassed over with, oh, yeah, right, okay, yeah. But she was standing there when I got my package. She was standing there when I read my card and I handed it to her. And I said to her, what, what do you think about how this might have made me, feel, made me feel to get this card from Twyla today? The girl said, well, I think it made you feel cared about. And Fern said, I cried and said, it made me feel like my life has purpose. I wasn't here for no reason. And it's about words. So she told me the story. And then she said, but you know, all these years you've been writing me and I've been answering you, but I never have told you something. I need to, I need to come clean and tell you something. I said, what is it? And she said, I don't remember saying that to you. <laughs> I don't remember saying that to you. I apologize, she said. I just don't remember saying that to you. Okay. When I think about 43 years of work and the blessed opportunity to lead so many wonderful programs and meet so many wonderful people, and I trace it back to a sentence I got the opportunity to be where I am standing right here today. I really believe from a sentence. Because I couldn't entertain the vision. I didn't have that vision. I didn't have that self, that picture of myself in my mind until this woman gave it to me in a sentence. Um, I just feel profound about that. So I started thinking to myself, how do we, how do we 
position ourselves? What do we do and how do we position ourselves to be available to give that message to other people? And, 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 how, and how do we prepare to receive the messages when they're coming to us? Because they're still coming. That wasn't the last message I've gotten. The messages are still coming. So how does one get into a place where they can hear that? I want to ask you, does this story, do these stories, these two stories, do they resonate with anything that's ever happened to you? Do I have any hands that say yeah? Come and tell me your story. Yo, hey, it's really easy. I can walk, but I can't come all that far. And they told me I couldn't move. Would you be willing to just say what your story what came to your mind? You just have to tell you how much I love you, but you know that, right? <laughs> uh, Twyla and I actually go back about 23 years, so she's just touched me in some awesome ways. I remember, guys, in fifth grade, I had a teacher named Miss Lawson. And the year before, Ms. my brother had been in Miss Lawson's class, and he was very, very smart, straight A's without even trying. And, um, and I was A's and B's, uh, but Miss Lawson didn't like me. So she made it her business every day to tell me that she didn't like me in some small way. She had to say something very ugly to me. And, um, but one of the most awesome things that happened while Miss Lawson was telling me all that I was not, I had a wonderfully awesome, beautiful, articulate, intelligent mother who held my face every day and told me how pretty I was and told me how smart I was. So I really didn't care much about what Miss Lawson said because <laughs> my mama said that I was pretty and smart. And a number of years went by and um, I had done an internship on the Hill in Washington. Miss Lawson saw my face and picture in the Houston Chronicle and called me and said, will you please come and speak with my class? And I, Ms. Lawson wants me. <laughs> Yo. So, <laughs> I thought, this is my opportunity. I have to tell her how she could have destroyed my life. Um, and when I got to Ms. Lawson's class that day, I saw some kids that looked like I looked when I was in Ms. Lawson's class. So I knew she was doing the same stuff. Did my little presentation about having been an intern on the Hill. Uh, and, um, and at the end of it, I got to say to Ms. Lawson, how very important it was that her words could have absolutely destroyed my life and how very important it was that from this day forward that she not only, that she sow seeds of love and kindness in these children's lives because she didn't know what they were living with. I just happened to be living in a good thing, in a good situation. They may not have been. Uh, a few days later, Ms. Lawson called me back and said, I will never treat a child the way I treated you. Whoa, whoa. And so not only did I make a difference in her life, but in the lives of children to follow in that class, but the blessing for me is that I had a parent who somehow knew, because I never told my mother what Ms. Lawson said, no. uh, but she knew enough to build me up inside. And so uh, from that, I think Ms. Lawson stopped destroying children's lives with her words. Oh, thank you, Kathy. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So what we've said, and what I think is important to reiterate is this, and that is that these moments can't be planned. You know, the times that we plan, where we've ever either been called into somebody's office for a, mo a meaningful moment, or we've called someone into our office for one of those moments, are not the memorable moments, as you know. It reminded me of a story, and this is a true story. There was a therapist, and he had a woman come to him for treatment, and she was a writer. And so she had writer's block, which was a major problem for her. And so she came for therapy. She couldn't figure out what was getting in the way. She couldn't write. She couldn't find time to write. She couldn't sit down. She just couldn't settle. And so after a couple of three sessions, the therapist said, I'll tell you what let's do. He said, we're going to have a session. And you leave. And you write about it. What happened in the session? You put it in an envelope and you put the date on it. Seal it. And I'll do the same. And then after 15 sessions, We'll exchange, we'll exchange letters, and you can see what I thought of the session, and I can see what you thought of it. Well, it was a great idea. So they went on, and they did it. Then at the end of the 15 sessions, they traded. So he had copied what he had written, 
And so when he got what she had written, he was able to lay them side by side. So he gets to about the 12th session, I think it was, and he reads his thing first. He says, this was a profound day in therapy. He said, I don't know where this inspiration came from. It was just in me and I felt it. But I was able to use a metaphor with Miss Jones about a ship on the ocean. And I described it in minute detail and the hull was huge. And it was so, it could withstand any storm. And, it was, and then there was all of the rudder and the sails and all the different components that had something to do with the, with the ship, of course. But the body of the ship was so sturdy and so stable and so capable. And I think I was able to communicate once and for all to Miss Jones, her core self is intact. And that other things might come at her and there might be these things that would ding on her but there would be nothing that could destroy her. She would stay afloat, she could go forward and I think I was able to lift her core self to a place where she might be able to break through this and go on and do the things she needs to do with her life. And I just think, I don't know, I have never felt so inspired as in that particular session. That was his note. He opened her note. And she says, um, Dr. Smith said he liked my dress. He thought I really looked good in blue. And that he noticed how observant I was and how smart I was. The end. So even when we think we're being profound, you know, and we're pretty convinced that our ego's telling us how profound we are, it just might be that we've missed the mark on it. Just might be, occasionally. Um, I think that that's the main focus of what we want to talk about today. How can we be most available to affect the lives of other people, to ensure our readiness to receive the messages from other people. And, and really pay attention to the ideas that we might have had that, that just are so far off. You know, I guess I thought, you know, I've worked all these years, I've worked in every single aspect of, of child welfare that I can think of. That from that ought to come great wisdom. And that maybe one day, I don't know, I don't exactly think I pictured a throne. I wouldn't have had really much permission to do that, but it was very close to a throne. And people would come to me. And they'd want to know questions. Oh, ask me anything. Ask me about foster care. Ask me about the redesign. I got some ideas about it. Ask me about uh, adoption, kinship care. Ask me about family group decision making. You know, I've lived it, I've studied on it, and I don't know, I would just say things, and people would go, whoa, I don't know what I had pictured, but I can tell you what I've got, and that's absolute ignorance. And I've learned as I get older and as I have had more and more rich experiences, and I don't think anything I've done in my career is richer than what I'm currently doing, I find that I just get ignoranter and ignoranter. Is that a word? So given that, given that knowledge of my ignorance, then I was confronted with the possibility that I might, to, I might ought to embrace my ignorance and see what would come out of that for me. And I'm suggesting that as a possible skill today. I, I, I embrace ignorance instead of wisdom. I have decided to put my arms around it. I have decided to let it lead me and it has been one of my most helpful friends. Because you see, when I'm ignorant, I have to let go of all my assumptions. I have to let go of my knowledge, and I have to let go of my thinking that I know. I mean, can you imagine the power of letting go of thinking that you know? I have to put things and people as priorities in my life and not as categories. I have to quit calling them names. Because you see, when I call people names, I, am I talking about the DSM-4? I don't know yet. If I call them names, then I am creating a level of superiority for me, not power for them. It's quite a different level. 
I have to then, instead of being knowledgeable, embrace my ignorance. I have to be curious then. I have to be curious, and it's been a great, one of the greatest blessings of my life, is to be curious. And Because you see, when I'm curious, I'm not judgmental. When I'm curious, I have to leave back my preconceived ideas behind me, and I have to wander into the land of the unknown. And when I'm curious, it makes me want to learn, and makes learning one of the top priorities of my life. So I'm wondering, what if, it was, what if it, we didn't so quickly see what we thought we know? what we knew and what the truth was? What if we didn't quickly see it? What if we quickly saw possibilities or wondered about possibilities? And this reminded me of a, a story uh, about, you've probably heard of Alcatraz. Just this past September, I was able to visit Alcatraz, so this story took on a whole different meaning for me. And the prison was open in 1934. It closed in 1963. And all that time, not a single soul ever escaped. Do you know why? Does anybody know why nobody escaped from Alcatraz? Tell me. Because you see, they knew the truth. And what is the truth? What is it? The water's freezing. If you, got, if you were able to get out of the prison and get in the water, you're going to freeze to death. What else? Sharks. Major sharks, right? Wicked current. No, nobody. As you see, because everybody knew the truth, nobody escaped. So the prison closes, and in 1981, along comes a man named Joe Oates. And he decided, you know what? Why don't we add the 1.5-mile uh, Alcatraz swim to our triathlon event? And everybody thought it was a great idea, and he did. And so since 1981, they've been having that annual swim. Mm -hmm. And, and they, there are actually several organized swims a year. And the Alcatraz Shark Fest swim was sold out six months before, last August 15th. The 28th annual Alcatraz Classic was, sold, was won by a 15-year-old girl who swam it in 33 minutes and 15 seconds. Now, if y'all are not that competitive, and you might have written it down because you're going to head right out and sign up, but if you weren't one of those people, then you can also sign up for the catfish crawl swim. And that's held in July. So, truth. Somebody knew the truth. This is my, my, my funnest story on the truth. And it's a guy named, and I'm going to tell you a sniblet about him. But if you're interested, his name is Cliff Young. If you're interested, look him up, because I'm telling you a little teeny thing. But he's a remarkable man. He lives in Australia, and every year in Australia, they do an 875-kilometer endurance race from Melbourne to Sydney. It's considered to be the longest and the toughest ultra-marathon. You've probably heard of that, Alvin, you runner. It's long, it's tough, takes a week, and it's usually participated in by world-class athletes who, who train specifically for the event, who have great sponsors like Nike. Most of the people are 30 years and younger. So in 1983, these runners were all in for a surprise. On the day of the race, this Cliff Young guy, he shows up, and he's 63 years old. He has on overalls. He has on galoshes over his work boots. He walked up to the table to take a number. It seemed to be obvious to everybody that he was going to run. And so he joined in the, the 150 people that were going to run this. And during that time, the, nobody that was running also, uh, either knew that his trainer was his mother, who was 81. And everybody thought it was a publicity stunt. They thought it was crazy. And so he gets in the pack, and then all of a sudden the, 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 the media gets interested in him, and they start following him, they ask him questions. And he says, um, who are you, and what are you doing? And he says, I'm Cliff Young, and I'm from a ranch over there outside Milburn. And uh, he said, you're going to run this race? He went, yep. He said, you got any bikers? Nope. He said, you can't run it then. He said, oh, yes, I can. He said, I, I grew up on a farm, and I, we couldn't afford any horses nor vehicles. So I've, when it comes up a storm, I had to get the sheep together, and there was 2,000 of them. We had over 2,000 acres, and sometimes I'd run for two or three days getting them all together. I think I can run this race. Well, anyway, the marathon started, and everybody started watching it on TV. 
And he was way behind, as you might imagine, when they started in his galoshes, and the crowd smiled, and they, they were tolerant, but they worried because he was 61 years old, and he was a potato farmer. And this was a world-class race, and they worried he might die. As a matter of fact, they worried he might die before he ever got out of Sydney. And every, as they were running, every professional athlete knew for certain that you had to run seven days to finish the race. And that in order to complete it, you had to run 18 hours and sleep six. But Cliff Young didn't know that. See, he didn't know that. He was ignorant. So when the morning news came and it was aired on TV, people were just thinking, oh my gosh, take this man out of this race. He is going to die. And he, he wasn't even close. But he didn't stop on the first day. And although he was still behind, he kept on running. They got to a, a town named Albury. And he's, they said, Cliff, what's your plan and what are your tactics for the rest of the race? And he said, I just plan to run till I win. That was his strategy. So he kept running and every night he, ran, he got a little closer. By the last night he'd passed all of them. And on the last day, he was way in front of them. Not only did he run at age 61 without dying, but he won first place and he broke records. He was a national hero, and he came out of nowhere to defeat the runners. He ran the race in five days, 15 hours and four minutes. Not knowing that he was supposed to sleep during the race, he said when running throughout the race that he imagined he was chasing sheep, and he had to try to outrun the, the storm. He won $10,000, and he said, I didn't even know there was any money related to this race. And he looked back and at the guys coming in behind him, and he said, those five guys had so much more trouble than I did, and he each gave, them, gave each of them $2,000. <laughs> now, what's curious about that, and then it goes on. But you, you can read that. What's really curious about that now is that in that particular race, uh, many have, that run it have adopted the, what they call the young shuffle because he ran real slow. He shuffled. But they thought it was hilarious, and now it's adopted as the ultra-marathon running style. And at least, um, at least three winners since then have used that style. And now, for this race, everybody knows, now listen to me, everybody knows now that you have to run all night and all day to win. So, I wonder what in our lives currently today seems impossible and really deserves further thought? What is it that we think we know? What is it that we have the truth about? Something that deserves a question. In order to be available to others and to myself, I have to try to remember that change is not always easy for me. And it isn't easy for others. I have to be coerced. I have to be arm wrestled into changing. Several weeks ago, I had dinner with a friend, and she told me about this weight loss patch. And you put it on, and, and, and she, had, she said a friend had lost two dress sizes in three weeks. I don't know why this fascinated me, because I don't wear dresses. But anyway, um, the woman was doing something different. She was eating whatever, she was doing something different on the weight. She was eating whatever she wanted. And she was just dropping this weight. So I thought, this is the diet for me. So I got the patches and I had them overnighted. I put them on. Can you guess what happened? I started craving everything in sight. I mean, I went on a diligent search for a chop chocolate eclair, and baby, you wouldn't want to get in my way. And I hadn't had a chocolate eclair in 20 years. And I found to my dismay several weeks later that I couldn't afford to go on with this diet because I was going to have to be moving into another wardrobe. But I understand this about myself. When I'm ready, when I'm really ready to do something different, I'll do it. Don't stand in my way, I'll do it. And this is just a little, a little thing that you're gonna say, wow, that didn't even fit. And I just want you to know that I know it doesn't fit. 
ahead of time before you write that on the evaluation. I didn't, that story didn't fit. But I think this story is funny. And there's probably 10 things I didn't talk about that I think are important, and I didn't mention laughter. I'm not going to mention that, except right now I am, which is really meaning that I am mentioning it, although I decided not to mention it because I have so much to say about it, I couldn't put it in here because it takes too long. But I think laughter <laughs> is one of the ways to stay in a good place to be receptive. <clears throat> and this company, this man called a company, and he ordered this weight loss program. It's called Five Days You Lose 10 Pounds. And he ordered it, he paid for it. So the next day there was a knock at the door and what stood before him was this gorgeous woman. She was about 19 years old. She was dressed only in just a pair of uh, Nike running shoes, that's it. She had a sign around her neck, catch me and I'm yours. So she took off. Without a thought he took off after her. A few miles later, huffing and puffing he gave up. So the next day, the same girl shows up, showed up for the next four days. So on the fifth day, he weighed himself and he was delighted to learn he'd lost 10 pounds. <laughs> so he called the company and he said, I want the five day 20 pound program. I said, okay. So there's a knock at the door and here's the, another beautiful woman. Beautiful. Only running shoes, nothing else. If you catch me, you can have me. So he's out the door like a shot. She's in excellent shape. Takes him a while before he can continue the next four days and some routine, the same routine happens over and over. Much to his delight on the fifth day, he weighs himself and he's lost 20 pounds. So he goes back, calls the company, says, I'm gonna go for broke. I want the seven day 50 pound program. The guy says, are you sure? That's a very extreme program. He says, yeah, I want it, I want it. He said, I'll, absolutely, I haven't felt this good in years, I'm ready for it. He says, okay, he takes his money. Next day, there's a knock at the door. He opens it, and there standing before him is Richard Simmons, <laughs> wearing nothing but pink tennis shoes. <laughs> and there's a sign around his neck, and he says, if I catch you, you're mine. <laughs> My challenge has been accepting the timetable that other people have because I can get into my assessment phase and I foolishly think I know better for them than, than they know for themselves and I have always and ever forever been wrong. Um, I don't assess clearly about my own timetable for change. How can I assess others? When I'm more tolerant of the journey of other people, um, then I can get in touch with my patience, the patience I need to have with myself. And I can, I can really get fascinated with and curious about my own journey and my own acceptance of myself, which is work in and of itself. In order to be uh, conscious to provide a space so that I can affect other people and that I may stay conscious to be affected, I have to realize that my most fierce competitor against that is myself. And how do we say it? I am my own worst enemy. So I try to stay conscious of my own self-talk and, and I know that my self-talk has the potential to lift me up and it has the potential to hold me optimistic and caring and it also has the potential to reduce me to fearfulness and to name-calling. As we've said in so many ways today, that words and intentions are important in our lives and our actions. They give messages about whether we're open to hear and whether we're open to engagement. And sometimes it takes the smallest gesture, the smallest word. I've mentioned the, the moments can't be planned, they can't be mapped out, they can't be part of a treatment plan. They come out of being myself. And when I purposefully bring myself to a situation, with all my struggles and curiosities, my realness, then I'm open to receiving these moments. Several years ago, we had a woman who was an intern with us at Depulchin Children's Center, and she went on to get her, a very successful woman, went on to get her master's in social work and has done some wonderful things. And um, she called me up a couple of years ago and she asked me to have lunch. And um, so we were having lunch and she said to me, you have no idea how you have changed my life. So, caught off guard, 
my ego's going, whoa. Maybe she uh, is going to tell me about how impressed she was with my teaching about family systems theory. And I am pretty knowledgeable about that. Or maybe she's going to really get into the fact that she has absorbed my passion for teamwork and team development. This happens in a split second. You know how these thoughts go through your mind. Or could it be that she has picked up on my love for family and my devotion for family and family preservation and she is, she's going to tell me how it's changed the priorities in her life. No, no, that's not what she said. She said that we'd been at a team meeting. We used to meet all day Thursdays and staff families back to back and sometimes we'd have potlucks. She said one day we were having a potluck. And uh, food was, she said food was everywhere. All kinds of food was everywhere. And she goes, she had just a few items on her plate. And I came up to her and I said, aren't you going to eat? And she said, well, I'm trying to take care of myself. And I said, well, I'm trying to take care of myself too, but I love to eat. How embarrassing is that? I don't remember saying that. But I can see myself saying that. According to this young woman, this, was, this day was the beginning of her work on a serious eating disorder. She was able to see it in a different way. She was able to think about it in a different way. She didn't tell anybody about it. You see, I didn't plan the intervention. I was doing in the moment what I love to do. I was just showing up. Oh, and eating, of course, but. And that's, that's what I think about the opportunity we all have in our lives. That the circumstances of our lives, all of our lives, to make a contribution, that every moment in our lives have led us to this moment. That our journey has formed a valuable tapestry, and every single thread in every tapestry in this room has been important that we have unique gifts, that we've cultivated in loneliness, we've cultivated them in shame, we've cultivated them in feelings of lostness and irony, questionings, joy, and laughter. These are the threads of our lives, and they are all blessed pre treasures to us. That's what we bring, and we know with a certainty that our life has meaning, and we know that right now, today, right here, and I'm grateful for this, too. This is right where you need to be. You aren't accidentally here. You're here for purpose. There's a reason you're here. So we're going to be embracing our ignorance. We're going to be seeing our possibilities. We're going to be standing open for change. We're going to be remaining conscious of our contemplative self. We're going to know that these things will equip us to be instruments of change and a comfort in this culture that I believe is starving, absolutely starving for these attributes. I want to close with a reading, a brief little baby reading by Andrea Lord. And it says, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. Thank you for taking the time to come today. I know you could have been doing other things. Thank you. Thank you, Twyla, for, again, uh, the inspiration, the th creating new thoughts among us and the work that we're doing and sending us out with uh, vigor and eagerness to get back to working with the people we're working with. So, And I want to thank you all for making a wonderful first national roundtable and to improve it and make it even better next year. We really would appreciate you filling out your evaluation forms and 
Also, if you want uh, continuing education credits, make sure you fill that out. Believe it or not, there's not a charge that's included in your registration. And uh, just make sure that if you would, just leave them on the back table as you leave. And have a safe uh, trip home, and hopefully you'll be able to spend the weekend here as well. Thank you.